Let's travel back in time, you know, 1973. This is Dr. Ernst Friedrich Schumacher, a German-British. He owned a CBE in 1974. He was an economic advisor to a lot of countries. And his works include Small is Beautiful, Good Work, A Guide for the Perplexed, amongst others. Shall we begin? Let's begin now. Page 116 Our instinct of self-preservation, one should have thought, would make us immune to the blandishments of guilt-ridden scientific optimism or the unproved promises of pecuniary advantages. It is not too late at this point for us to reconsider old decisions and make new ones, says a recent American commentator. For the moment at least, the choice is available. Once many more centers of radioactivity have been created, there will be no more choice whether we can cope with the hazards or not. It is clear that certain scientific and technological advances of the last 30 years have produced and are continuing to produce hazards of an altogether intolerable kind. At the Fourth National Cancer Conference in America in September 1960, Lester Breslow of the California State Department of Public Health reported that tens of thousands of trout in western hatcheries suddenly acquired liver cancers and continued thus. Technological changes affecting man's environment are being introduced at such a rapid rate and with so little control that it is a wonder man has thus far escaped the type of cancer epidemic occurring this year among the trout. To mention these things, no doubt, means laying oneself open to the charge of being against science, technology and progress. Let me therefore, in conclusion, add a few words about future scientific research. Man cannot live without science and technology any more than he can live against nature. What needs the most careful consideration, however, is the direction of scientific research. We cannot leave this to scientists alone. As Einstein himself said, almost all scientists are economically completely dependent, and the number of scientists who possess a sense of social responsibility is so small that they cannot determine the direction of research. The latter dictum applies, no doubt, to all specialists and the task therefore falls to the intelligent layman, to people like those who form the National Society for Clean Air and other similar societies concerned with conservation. They must work on public opinion so that the politicians, depending on public opinion, will free themselves from the thraldom of economism and attend to the things that really matter. What matters, as I said, is the direction of research, that the direction should be towards non-violence rather than violence, towards an harmonious cooperation with nature rather than a warfare against nature, towards the noiseless, low-energy, elegant and economical solutions normally applied in nature rather than the noisy, high-energy, brutal, wasteful and clumsy solutions of our present-day sciences. The continuation of scientific advance in the direction of ever-increasing violence, culminating in nuclear fission and moving on to nuclear fusion, is a prospect of terror threatening the abolition of man. Yet it is not written in the stars that this must be the direction. There is also a life-giving and life-enhancing possibility. The conscious exploration and cultivation of all relatively non-violent, harmonious, organic methods of cooperating with that enormous, wonderful, incomprehensible system of God-given nature of which we are a part and which we certainly have not made ourselves. This statement, which was part of a lecture given before the National Society for Clean Air in October 1967, was received with thoughtful applause by a highly responsible audience, but was subsequently ferociously attacked by the authorities as the height of irresponsibility. 
The most priceless remark was reportedly made by Richard Marsh, then Her Majesty's Minister of Power, who felt it necessary to rebuke the author. The lecture, he said, was one of the more extraordinary and least profitable contributions to the current debate on nuclear and coal cost. Daily te- printed in Daily Telegraph, 21st October 1967. However, times change. A report on the control of pollution presented in February 1972 to the Secretary of State for the Environment by an officially appointed working party published by Her Majesty's Stationery Office and entitled Pollution, Nuisance or Nemesis has this to say. The main worry is about the future and in the international context. The economic prosperity of the world seems to be linked with nuclear energy. At the moment, nuclear energy provides only 1% of the total electricity generated in the world. By the year 2000, if present plans go ahead, this will have increased to well over 50% and the equivalent of two new 500 megawatt reactors, each the size of the one at Trosfinit in Snowdonia, will be opened every day on radioactive wastes of nuclear reactors. The biggest cause of worry for the future is the storage of the long-lived radioactive wastes. Unlike other pollutants, there is no way of destroying radioactivity. So there is no alternative to permanent storage. In the United Kingdom, strontium-90 is at the present time stored as a liquid in huge stainless steel tanks at wind scale in Cumberland. They have to be continually cooled with water since the heat given off by the radiation would otherwise raise the temperature to about boiling point. We shall have to go on cooling these tanks for many years, even if we build no more nuclear reactors. But with the vast increase of strontium-90 expected in the future, the problem may prove far more difficult. Moreover, the expected switch to fast breeder reactors will aggravate the situation even further, for they produce large quantities of radioactive substances with very long half-lives. In effect, we are consciously and deliberately accumulating a toxic substance on the off chance that it may be possible to get rid of it at a later date. We are committing future generations to tackle a problem which we do not know how to handle. Finally, the report issues a very clear warning. The evident danger is that man may have put all his eggs in the nuclear basket before he discovers that a solution cannot be found. There would then be powerful political pressures to ignore the radiation hazards and continue using the reactors which had been built. It would be only prudent to slow down the nuclear power program until we have solved the waste disposal problem. Many responsible people would go further. They feel that no more nuclear reactors should be built until we know how to control their wastes. And how is the ever-increasing demand for energy to be satisfied? Since plant demand for electricity cannot be satisfied without nuclear power, they consider mankind must develop societies which are less extravagant in the use of electricity and other forms of energy. Moreover, they see the need for this change of direction as immediate and urgent. No degree of prosperity could justify the accumulation of large amounts of highly toxic substances, which nobody knows how to make safe and which remain an incalculable danger to the whole of creation for historical or even geological ages. To do such a thing is a transgression against life itself, a transgression infinitely more serious than any crime ever perpetrated by man. The idea that a civilization could sustain itself on the basis of such a transgression is an ethical, spiritual and metaphysical monstrosity. It means conducting the economic affairs of man as if people really did not matter at all. Thank you for watching. Bye.